Uh, well, hello everyone. I figured I would just show you uh, my face uh, before we begin. I'm, I'm not going to keep the video on, but uh, I'd like to welcome you all uh, to my session on Leadership 2.0. And, uh, you know, obviously I might look a little different uh, right now with this video since I don't have my Blackberry in front of my face or I'm not in a uh, suit and tie. So I'm just assuming that everyone can hear me okay. Um, and if that's the case, uh, I am going to begin. Um, maybe I'll put the video on at the end and uh, answer any questions uh, you have. All right, so uh, again, welcome to my session on Leadership 2.0. Uh, my name is Eric Scheninger. Uh, many people know me as NMHS Principal on Twitter. Uh, I am the principal of New Milford High School, which is in New Milford, New Jersey. And New Milford is about 10 minutes east, I'm sorry, 10 minutes west of the George Washington Bridge. Uh, so about 10 minutes west of New York City. Uh, the town I work in is about two square miles. My high school serves 650 students. We're blue collar and we are very diverse. My parents speak over 40 different languages. Why am I telling you this? I'm telling you this because I'm going to discuss a lot of amazing things, in my humble opinion, that are going on in New Milford High School. And if we can accomplish and put these initiatives into place at New Milford, there is no reason that they cannot work at any school, regardless of socioeconomic uh, status. So let's begin. Now, I, I think when we talk about Leadership. You know, we only hear 21st century. Maybe that's not the appropriate term now, but, you know, I, I think this slide's very important because, you know, more often than not, you know, the people in charge of leading school organizations into the 21st century are often the least knowledgeable about the 21st century. It's very difficult to initiate sustainable change that's going to withstand the test of time, especially when it comes to technology, if those leaders are not immersed in the technological world themselves. They really have to go far beyond talking the talk and walking the walk. Uh, digital leadership is not about putting whiteboards, interactive whiteboards in every classroom or just going one-to-one. -one. What is that leader doing themselves to help staff integrate technology effectively so that students are using it to demonstrate conceptual mastery? You know, I think this slide is also uh, very appropriate. You know, as things are changing, mainly society, you know, some schools are reinventing themselves for a digital global age. Unfortunately, most are not. And it's those few schools that are reinventing themselves, that are transforming their teaching and learning environments that will ultimately prepare the students to best succeed in a world that is constantly evolving. And it's very important that schools prepare students for jobs that don't even exist yet. But if they're not jumping on this digital bandwagon, if they're not seeing the changes and shifts outside their walls and windows, they really are doing a disservice to their primary stakeholder, which is students. So I, I think we all can agree that education is changing. You know, these are the characteristics that I look for in a teacher. I want them to be able to adapt. I want them to be effective communicators. I want them to be the lead learner in their classroom. I want them to have a vision. I want them also to be a leader. I want them to model, collaborate, and take risks. I feel that I try to exemplify these characteristics, but I mean, if we truly want to create an educational system that resonates with our students, that they find relevant, meaningful, and can apply what they've learned, we really need to cultivate teachers to, you know, embody these characteristics. These are the drivers of change, or the catalysts of change. And 
a lot of these characteristics will come to pass or come to fruition when leaders give up control because these characteristics are pretty messy and it, you know but leaders have to be willing to give up control in order to let teachers flourish uh, and do great things. So you know what should educators in a digital age do? Well obviously they should share their vision. The most important thing they can do is start conversations. You, uh, any educator regardless of their role, the most powerful catalyst for change we have is the conversations with those that are doing the same jobs that we are. When you have those conversations, you can learn from other educators and you do not have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, educators in the digital age lead by example. They embrace innovation and technology integration and they are transparent. Um, you know, I love uh, social media because it gives me the platform to tell everyone, my stakeholders, people in other uh, states and countries exactly what I'm doing it all the time and what my students are doing. And educators in the digital age leverage the power of Web 2.0. Uh, the educational landscape is changing. I'm sorry about the word there. It got blocked off a little bit when my slides got converted. Um, you know, everywhere we look, there are new tools coming out or they are evolving, whether it's tablets, interactive whiteboards, social media, uh, mobile learning devices, document cameras that can record, being able to connect and collaborate globally. You know, the landscape is changing. This comes back to my first point is it's so important for leaders to not only understand the tools that are available, but how we can effectively harness these tools to enhance the teaching and learning uh, environment. So it's very important that we understand these shifts. But the most important shift or change is that of our learner. Our learners are fundamentally different than they were a few mere years ago. They are rewired. It is not their fault. And we can't fault them for coming to school and being disengaged because the environment that we put them through in many schools across the globe is the total opposite of the world that they are growing up in. Now, you know, I look at my own two children. I have a six-year-old and a seven-year-old, and when they say that the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, that's pretty accurate. Uh, both my children have their own eye touches. Uh, my daughter has an uh, iPad mini. My son has a laptop. My daughter has a laptop. Uh, my son plays Xbox Live, Minecraft on Xbox Live. You know, I feel as an educator, it is my job to teach them how they can use these tools uh, for learning. And I think the best example is, you know, one day I came home from work and my children, you know, they usually ignore me, but on this particular day they, they ignored me uh, immensely and they were sitting at the kitchen table. And I go to my wife, I go, honey, what are they doing? They're laughing, they're talking, they're looking at their devices. And she goes, Eric, I have no idea what they're doing. So I go over to my daughter who was four at the time. And I go, Bella, what are you doing? She goes, I'm playing Sims, Daddy. Now, for those of you who don't know what Sims is, Sims is a uh, social media tool where you create your own interactive world. So I go, Bella, who taught you how to play Sims? She goes, Nicky did. So I go over to my son, who was six at the time, and I go, Nick, who taught you how to play Sims? He goes, nobody, Daddy. I learned it myself. He used the word learn. What essential skills were they using? Communication, collaboration, creativity. My son was also using manipulation. I don't know if that's really an essential skill, but he was manipulating his daughter to help him buy a house. Um, and what he wanted, what she wanted was a little puppy, so he was able to give her less to get more. But it's all these, you know, problem solving, all these skill sets. And how are they achieving it? Sitting at the table, talking to each other, communicating with a tool. 
But the problem is schools and many educators are not changing. As I mentioned before, there's a huge disconnect between our systems of education and society. And students grow up in, I mean, I don't know about you, but I mean, this it is such an amazing age to be a part of right now. Being able to access information, have conversations like we are right now. So many amazing things, but why are schools not, you know, jumping on board? Why are they not catering to the interests and uh, motivations of our students? Well, this is one problem, is that the tools that our students are using outside of school uh, are treated like, uh, you know, offenders, uh, big time problems. I mean, you hear YouTube, Facebook, and student devices in schools, and, and administrators just are like, no way, no, they're problems, blah, blah, blah. Many people, I don't know, some people know this, but I was that administrator. Prior to March 2009, this was my school. I firmly believed that social media and student devices could do absolutely nothing to enhance the teaching and learning environment. Now, that's how I felt. So as the principal, that is how I structured my school. My school was on lockdown. And I know it's a little hard for some people to believe, but, you know, I ruled with an iron fist. And I was very, very proud of the environment that I had created for my students because I really thought that I was distracting them from all of these sites and tools that would inhibit increases in student achievement. So what changed? Well, for me, it was social media. And I think a lot of the reasons why I ran the school the way that I did was because I was not educated on how social media could be used as a teaching and learning tool or also as a leadership tool. Now, I know this diagram is a little hard to see, but in the middle, it talks about conversation. All social media is, is a tool to have conversations around mutual interests. So it could be Facebook, YouTube, it could be social bookmarking, it could be wikis, music, events, it does not matter. But when you have conversations, great things happen. Because this is where ideas, the best ideas, the best ideas for our students travel, they flourish, they're passed along, they're adopted, adapted. And that is why we're seeing more and more schools embracing social media. But as they embrace social media, social media is sort of just the doorway or the window that when you open it up, it, you know, it just opens leaders, educators up to a world of infinite world of possibilities on how we can do what we do better. So, you know, for me, going from the biggest social media opponent to a uh, social media evangelist, I really uh, chalk it up to Twitter. And, you know, often when I speak, I, I sit up there and I tell the audience that, you know, this is going to sound like the stupidest thing ever. but all of my school successes, all of my successes, I really have to give the credit to Twitter. Because Twitter gave me my voice. Twitter helped me find and develop my personal learning network. Twitter helped me communicate better. Twitter helped me enhance our public relations. And this is all the things I'm going to go into. But it wasn't until a Sunday morning in March 2009 that I read a newspaper article about Twitter. And at the time, I thought Twitter was the dumbest thing since sliced bread, that it was about Ashton Kutcher and Shaquille O'Neal jockeying for how many followers they had. Why would I care if Sally's eating a sandwich, if Bob's going on a date, and if John is taking a nap? 
Stupid, stupid, stupid. But I still read the article. And as I read the article, I discovered that, you know what, I could use Twitter to communicate more effectively with my stakeholders. That is the only reason I got on Twitter, to communicate. But a funny thing happened. As I was communicating, sending out a message about New Milford High School, I noticed this niche of passionate educators that were talking a different language. Web 2.0, Glogster, VoiceThread, personalized learning, open courseware. I'm like, what? I don't know what any of this stuff is. But I was interested. And it was that interest, that intrinsic motivation to really incorporate some of these exciting ideas into my school that shifted my behavior from communicator to learner. So I lurked and learned. I think that's the best thing that anyone can do is lurk and learn. And for me, that is the reason why my school uh, has accomplished the things that it's done and why I've won some awards. I didn't win any awards until I got on Twitter. It was all because I learned, I reflected, I got pushback, and my collective network made me a better principal. All because spending some time working and learning. So, you know, social media, in order to embrace Leadership 2.0, leaders, regardless of your position, have to understand that social media is not the enemy. And when I say leader, I'm not talking about just principals and superintendents. We all have the capacity to lead. Teachers, bus drivers, students, it doesn't matter what your role is. But for Leadership 2.0 to be a reality, we have to understand that social media is not the enemy. And it is never too late to jump on the bandwagon. Social media is not going away. It's going to change, just like MySpace is gone and Friendster is gone. Facebook will probably be gone someday. But it will evolve into some other tool. And the longer that we uh, do not embrace social media, the more irrelevant and meaningless our schools will become to our students. This is the real world. Businesses, politicians, grandparents, parents, athletes, you name it, they're on social media. The one group that is the most, I would say, the most dominant group that is not on social media are those trusted with leading schools in the digital age. That is a big fundamental problem and a roadblock to moving forward and transforming our schools that will really be primed to help our students succeed in this amazing, difficult, challenging world. So, you know, social media really is a multidimensional tool. Think about what you want going on in your classrooms. If you're an administrator, what do you want going on in your schools? You want students involved. You want parents involved. You want other stakeholders involved. You want teachers involved. You want students to create artifacts of learning to demonstrate conceptual mm -hmm. mastery. You want to unleash that creativity because that's what they're dying to do. I look at my son and my daughter when they play Minecraft, and they come up to me with the biggest smiles on their face and be like, Daddy, look what I created in Minecraft. Then I ask how and why, and we have a very intelligent conversation. Students want to create. They do not want to bubble in answers on a standardized test. They don't want to fill in the blank and do true and false. They do not want to do that. They want to basically be their own artists, and artists in a sense that they can make their own art in whatever subject they are passionate about. Also, social media allows us to discuss, discuss what's important, discuss how we can get better. 
Now, when I put my leader hat on, I really think about the fact that I want to be able to promote all the great things that are going on in my school. And I also want to measure the efforts that I put into social media. Social media is the best tool, regardless of your role, to promote all the great things that we are doing in whatever country we're in. Because you know what? All our education systems are not as bad as everyone says. And then the measurement piece, you look at Facebook, you look at retweets, all that stuff, you can measure the impact. So what do we need to do? We must learn how to use digital tools to enhance school culture and improve stakeholder relations. We must learn how to leverage the real-time web to grow professionally like never before. We must also learn how technology can be effectively integrated in the classroom to increase student engagement and achievement. This is what I call a social media strategy. We need to have a strategy or else it's going to fail. We need to have goals. We need to be able to measure whether or not we have met those goals. These questions help guide you into developing your own social media strategy, whether it's as a school leader, a teacher leader, or even as a uh, other stakeholder, as a vested interest in the school system. So I've gone over the why, and I hope that I've emphasized enough why we need to have leaders and have educators embrace social media. Now I'm going to go over the how. And again, I want to stress that all of these pillars of Leadership 2.0, as I call them, can be applied whether you're an administrator or a teacher. Now, look at this list of six pillars and ask yourself if you can find value in what you do in one or more of those pillars. This, to me, helps define, these pillars help define my social media strategy. And I apologize for the phone ringing in the background. Um, this helps me define my social media strategy. And this is the reasons why I use social media. So I'm going to break each down and give you uh, an example. Oh, good. I'm glad you didn't hear the phone ringing in the background. So let's begin with pillar number one, communication. You know, communication is an essential skill. I think no matter what profession we're in, we need to be able to effectively communicate. But I think in a real-time world, it makes sense to use the tools and meet our stakeholders where they are at. This might be a shock to some of you. People do not go to school websites anymore. They don't. People don't read snail mail. They don't read newsletters. But guess what? They will read a newsletter if you have it tweeted out on a Facebook page, redirecting them back to your website. Uh, Twitter and Facebook are the two probably most predominant communication tools we have on the planet. Billions of people are using Twitter and Facebook. So why aren't schools using Twitter as a means to communicate real-time information. As a parent of two young children, I want to know when the meetings are. I want sports scores. I want emergency updates. I want to hear about staff achievements. I want to hear about student accomplishments. I want to hear about campus weather. And what better way than to establish a Twitter account that not only can we push those updates out, but our stakeholders can get that real-time information on their phones, on their devices, when they want it. This is the uh, uh, Twitter feed for New Milford High School. As you can see, where the nights were green and white. Everything I do on social media as a principal all comes back to my school. And for those of you that are interested or wondering, all our social media tools basically are managed by me. Small school, but again, I feel that I need to model uh, what I expect from my students, my staff, and my community. 
So this is my, uh, my home account, my flagship, and that is my school in the background. Um, so for me, social media is about professional practice. Um, I don't really use it for personal reasons. This, uh, this Twitter page for commu is basically about communicating my thoughts on leadership, sharing what's going on in my school, uh, piggybacking on the school Twitter account. But, but again, this is my primary learning account, but this is where it all got started uh, for me. So the other tool is, is Facebook. Now, I didn't get on Facebook until April 2010. I fought it off for a year. Even though I love Twitter, I'm like, you know what, there's no way I'm using Facebook. No way. Well, I can honestly say that my students are the ones that pushed me to uh, embrace Facebook. They're like, you know what, Mr. Scheninger, if you want to communicate better with us, you've got to get on Facebook. So I was scared. I was never on Facebook. So I did what any intelligent digital immigrant would do. I found myself a digital native. And two days after my students told me about face, getting on Facebook, I was in Long Island, and I was at my brother and sister-in-law's house, and I pulled aside my 10-year-old nephew and said, Joseph, I need help creating a Facebook page, knowing that Joseph wasn't even old enough to be on Facebook. So my 10-year-old my uh, nephew helped me create this Facebook page, which has become the hub. Everyone goes to our Facebook page. Go and look at it. But you want to know what really makes this an effective communication tool? Is that it fosters two-way communication. Any of you right now can go to the Milford High School Facebook page and comment. I am not going to stop you. I can't stop you. The important takeaway here is if your Facebook page is locked down, and it's only pushing out information, it is no different than a website. It's static, it's boring, you're not fostering that interaction that you really want. And if you're fearful of what might happen, I can tell you right now, in three years, I've removed three comments. And they weren't even that bad. When you model Twitter and Facebook as professional tools, that is how your stakeholders treat them. We get every stakeholder group commenting on here. We get parents, grandparents, students, business members, you name it, they're commenting here. Why? It's a sense of pride. When I communicate on here, people like it, they comment, they ask me, they email me, hey, Mr. Schoeninger, can you put this on the page? That's why it's become our hub. My second pillar is public relations. Don't leave your public relations to chance because I think we all know that if we don't tell our story, someone else will. And when someone else tells our story, nine out of ten times, it is not the story that we want told. The media, unfortunately, tends to not be our friends. They want to sell papers, subscriptions. They want to make money. How do they make money? They do it with the juiciest, most controversial articles about schools and educators that they can find. I'm here to tell you, you don't have to settle for that anymore. When you tell your own story, you take control of your public relations. You control the output. You even control the input. You have the ability to form a foundation for consistent, positive public relations, which will totally change the dynamics of your school culture. You want to see how it's changed the dynamics in New Milford High School? This is an example of some media outlets that you've probably heard of. They have all done numerous stories on the Milford High School over the past four years that we've been using social media. CBS Channel 2 New York City has done seven featured stories on my students and my staff. We've been on the back of the front cover of USA Today and Education Week, on the front page of the record, which is New Jersey's second largest pay, pay, uh, newspaper. 
Scholastic Administrator. You know, you saw my ugly mug before, but what you did see were the three articles in there about my teachers and my students. This all started because we told our story. Everyone now knows what, social, what we're doing with social media at New Milford High School. We have developed a sound strategy that works for us, and it has opened up the world to all the incredible things that we're doing. And to give you an example, I just got done proofing a case study on how my school is using open courseware. That case study happens to be written by MIT, who, who, by the way, came up with the open courseware. They found out about what we were doing with open courseware because of social media. It is amazing what we can do. We no longer have to settle for everyone telling us that we're no good at the jobs that we do. We are good. We are all doing amazing things regardless of where we're at. But if we're not telling our story, the public will continue to feed off the negative rhetoric, and they will continue to believe and build this perception that systems of education are fundamentally broken. People want to send that message because they want to make money off of us, whether it be uh, with the Common Core or teacher evaluation systems in the United States. Listen, the rhetoric will continue, but we know we're doing a good job. So I implore you to please tell your story. You can tell your story with a variety of free tools. At New Milford, I've set up YouTube, Vimeo, and Ustream channels. Flickr accounts and blogs. Uh, by the way, uh, if you've read Drive by Dan Pink, you know what an incredible author Dan Pink is. And earlier this year, I was fortunate enough through social media to connect with Dan Pink. And I asked Dan, I'm like, Dan, I want to do a book, book club with my kids. They're going to read Drive, all of them. Would you be willing to Skype in? He said yes. He Skyped in and for an hour, answered questions from 50 New Milford High School students. What did I do? I streamed it live with Ustream, and I recorded it. Why? So that I could share it with my board, my superintendent, and anyone else that wanted to hear Dan Pink's message, but more importantly, wanted to see what our students were doing. Dan Pink on the video said, wow, you guys are asking me some tough questions. That is an authentic learning experience. It could not be duplicated in the classroom. And we basically are, you know, we should be compelled to share those stories. It is not bragging with social media. When you're talking about your kids, your teachers, and your schools, it is not bragging. Well, it is bragging, but it's good bragging. Brag, please. Um, probably the best tool we have for public relations are blogs. Blogs give us an unprecedented form to expand on ideas, to discuss innovative practices, and, and do all these incredible things with video and pictures. And I'm going to tell you this right now. Don't think for one minute that your voice does not matter. I grew up in rural New Jersey. I graduated with a high school, 400 kids, 100 people in my class. There's still cows by my parents' house, cornfields. I thought that no one would ever care what I have to say. Even in New Milford, small communities surrounded by some of the most affluent communities, high achieving districts in the state and the country. But you want to know something? Your voice matters. This was a screenshot from my blog. Again, all I did was start a blog to share what my students and staff were doing. I never knew, I never sought out to have people read my blog on five different continents. That was not my goal. But this comes back to a point I made earlier. Good news travels fast. Good ideas are embraced, adapted, and implemented 
the more people that share this good news, you build that stakeholder support. And that those stakeholders will then be there to support you, your school, your students through thick and thin. I've seen it. And again, when people, whenever there is a negative story, for every negative, there's nine positives. So we've taken the flipped approach. We've flipped our, our profession, our public relations, so that it works for us. Um, my third pillar is branding. I'll talk about this one quick because when you use tools to communicate and for public relations, you send a message. Apple, Adidas, Nike. You look at those images and it tells you something. It resonates with you, positive or negative. You know, with McDonald's, my kids love the McDonald's. They think Happy Meals, chicken nuggets, french fries. I saw something on the news that had to do with the color pink a few years ago. I, I can't eat McDonald's. So every time I see the golden arches, I have negative thoughts. But McDonald's wants positive. Every tool that I use, uh, thank you, Anna, for uh, pointing out that uh, <laughs> the pink stuff. Um, everything you've seen so far, from our Twitter feeds, Facebook, to my personal Twitter, everywhere, are the pillars of New Milford, which is my building, the knights, our colors, and our name. Our brand, my brand, are the students of New Milford. And what does our brand stand for? Innovation, creativity, increasing student achievement, increasing graduation rates. Uh, all these great things that we're doing, we put out there in social media. And that's why when people think about New Milford, or here in New Milford, they automatically think of these great things that we're doing. So when you use tools for public relations and communication, you are creating a brand. The brand is your school, it's your work, it's your culture. And we need to be proud of our brand and make sure that we create a positive instead of a negative brand. So all brands, what do they do? They hype themselves. Hype your brand, which is your students, and most importantly, it's the work you do for students. So hype that up, let people know. So my fourth pillar is professional development and growth. You know, I, I think this really goes without saying, I mean, this for me is, was the real big game changer. And I think when you look at professional development, you know, you have the organizational needs and the individual needs. More often than not, the organizational needs trump our needs. Now, quality professional development, it's in the middle. It's A and B. But you want to know something? I'm more concerned about my individual needs. I'm selfish, as I think we all should be. We are told to differentiate instruction for our students to meet the diverse learning needs, which is something we, we need to do, we should do. It's why we're in education. But why is it that professional development, the way it's structured now, ignores our individual needs? It does. Think about a session that you've ever been to, a conference, a training that met every single participant needs, that is a challenge. I might even go out on a limb and say that's near impossible. So how do we create an effective model of professional development that is going to meet our needs? We do it through the real-time web. We do it by creating a personal learning network, a PLN, that is available to us anytime, anywhere, we can get real-time knowledge, resources, you name it, whenever we want. Listen, I am that guy that goes to the beach with a big plastic bag with my iPhone in it. Why am I that guy? Because I don't want to read magazines about 
uh, you know, juicy stuff that's in uh, Us Magazine or the Inquirer or anything like that. I want real-time updates on Twitter that are going to help me get better. And if everyone else is reading a book, who, who are they going to tell me that I can't sit there on my phone? Yeah, I might send out a personal tweet or a picture of my kids or something, but you want to know something? There's nothing more powerful than being able to learn on my time. And if I choose to learn on my vacation, that's my prerogative. But what else can you do with a personal learning network? You can connect with the best minds in the field as well as practitioners. I mean, there is nothing more empowering than being able to get into the brains of Diane Ravitch, Todd Whitaker, uh, Andy Hargraves. Um, I even saw a, a person here right now, I don't know if she's still here, but Jackie Gerstein, I mean, a, an amazing educator. And uh, I hope she's still in the room. But, I mean, again, I'm connecting with ASCD, but we've been following each other on Twitter for years. It's amazing what you can do. And the best part, it's free. There's nothing more cost effective than developing your own personal learning network. What do you get out of it? Well, what do you find, what do you get out of any successful training? You acquire new knowledge, resources, you get feedback, strategies, ideas, you can track conferences. It's endless. I'm going to skip this slide because it's pretty hard to see. But these are some common personal learning network tools that are free. I've talked about Twitter. If you're a member of ASCD, you can join ASCD Edge. EdWeb.net. EdWeb is an amazing free tool. Here's my shameless plug. Uh, with EdWeb, I run a community called uh, Leadership 2.0. So you can learn more about what I'm talking about today from experts, practitioners like all of you from all over the country. So if you go to, uh, I'm going to type it in really, really fast. If you go to edweb.net backslash leadership, there it is in the chat box, you can join this community for free. What do you get? Webinars that are archived. You get discussion forums. You get whatever your heart desires to grow professionally. You also have some great uh, Ning sites, the educatorspln.com, uh, which was created by my friend Tom Whitby. And then, of course, you have, you know, the, the granddaddy of them all, uh, Classroom 2.0, which is listed down there. Again, great tools. In addition, you also have blogs. It, it, it's amazing stuff. All right, why are you not going slide? So the idea here is... We don't want our students to ever stop learning, so why should we? And when learning is fun, when we're in the driver's seat determining what and when we want to learn, we are driven by intrinsic motivation, and it is like a drug. For me, I never want to stop learning. I'm afraid of what I'm going to miss. I'm afraid of opportunities that I might miss and not be able to implement in my school. The sky is the limit with a personal learning network. You get what you give. The more you give, the more you get. But you could sit there and not interact, which I don't agree with, but you could lurk and learn and get some of the most fabulous ideas and implement them in your school, and you will look like the, the, the grandest innovator of all. And that's okay, because social media works on the premise that together we are better. Let's share our ideas. Let's help each other because if we're helping each other, we're helping kids. You know, I was so uh, passionate about personal learning networks that I wanted all my staff to create their own. And just so you know, there are no mandates to use technology at my school. There's no mandates to do anything. But we took a page out of the Google 80-20 model of innovation, and I gave my teachers embedded time every week, two to three 40-minute periods a week, to learn about whatever they want. I've encouraged them to create their own PLNs, to learn how to integrate a variety of web tools. But you want to know something? The key is the motivation. 
as found by Dan Pink. Autonomy, mastery, and purpose. When you give teachers the time during the day and you give them the autonomy to become, become masters of their craft, guess what? They find purpose in what they do. And what's happening in New Milford? We become an incubator for innovative ideas because the control is gone, the chains are unleashed, and our teachers can follow their passions and learn about whatever they want to learn about. All right, my fifth pillar, student engagement and learning. I have a variety of tools listed here for you. The one thing they have in common, they all fall under the umbrella of social media. Because of that, many of them are blocked, which is a travesty. Because all these tools that you're looking at are free. And when we talk about essential skill sets, and again, I purposely do not use the word 21st century skills because, I don't know, the these skills are no different than the 20th century, in my opinion, but I call them essential skills. These are skills that our students have to, be, have, to have to succeed in a digital world. All of these tools unleash creativity, can foster critical thinking and problem solving. Yeah, I know, I know Peggy Wallisher is gone. It's Padlet. I hate that new name. Um, what was I saying? Oh, they unleash creativity. They uh, foster communication, collaboration. They instill global awareness if they're used, like Skype. Um, and they teach or uh, technological literacies. So why are we not using them? You know, my students are going, oh, I like that. It's the now century. Thanks, Jim. You know, my students are going to Europe for 10 days starting next week. They will be in the Czech Republic, Poland, and Germany. Guess what they do every day? They blog. They take video, they upload to YouTube, they take pictures. They chronicle every day of their learning. There is nothing more powerful as a community member or as a principal to see learning taking place outside the walls of my building. With Twitter, our students in digital journalism, as part of the course requirement, they have to create their own professional Twitter account and they have to report on news in real time as it breaks, as it happens. They have the autonomy to tweet in any class they want, as long as it's about breaking news. We're using Edmodo. Um, in some classes, we're using it to flip instruction. Teachers are uh, posting small videos that they take themselves with recordable document cameras. Um, and they're using it in athletics, other activities. We just did a project in English where Instagram was used um, to help with a concept. It's on my blog if you do a search. And guess what? It was aligned to the Common Core. We Skype with Holocaust survivors. We use Poll Everywhere as a student response system with our mobile learning devices. There are so many things that we're doing. I can go on and on and on. But what do these do? When you combine sound pedagogy and great teaching with these tools, you are creating the ultimate student-centered learning environment. Students should be using real-world tools to do real-world work. These are the real-world tools. They need to be integrated. Leaders have to understand that students can create their own art and I take that to create your own art if you've read Lynchpin by Seth Godin, amazing book. If you've not read it, get it. Create your own art. And, you know, when you do, you're inspired and you basically become indispensable. I want indispensable students, learners. Uh, putting link, there is the book right there. So, let me go. You know, I took this uh, infographic from my good friend Kelly Tankley in Colorado. There are apps for everything. Creation, evaluation, analysis, application, understanding, whatever. There's so many free tools out there. It's just a matter of opening your, our eyes and creating a culture where we can take calculated risks to learn how to effectively integrate these tools. And by integrate, 
I mean, it's about what the students are doing with the tools, not the teacher. What are the students doing to demonstrate conceptual mastery? That is what I want to say. So, I know I flipped through a few slides because I'm getting close to my time quota. You know, we we become a bring your own device school district. Again, you want to talk about the shifts, the changes. You know, we went from lockdown to the red carpet. And today uh, I posted on Twitter and on Instagram how we were uh, in a Google Hangout today with Greg Tapa, who is the national education reporter, another guy I connected with through Twitter. And he commented, he's like, Eric, does any kid in here have paper and pencil or a pen? I'm like, nope. He noticed that every kid had a device out. And what they do? They had written their, prepared their questions on their own devices and were taking notes on their own devices. And here's a national education reporter for USA Today telling my kid, students how impressed he was. That is the real world. Why don't we let the students use the tools that they're using outside of class? Because if we do, not only helping them become better learners, not only helping them increase their productivity, but we're teaching them a very valuable lesson on digital citizenship, responsibility, and how they create a positive digital footprint. This is a mobile learning device. It is a tool an amazing tool that can be used to enhance teaching and learning. So my final pillar is opportunity. Who doesn't want a little bit of opportunity? Well, here's a list of some different organizations that New Milford has formed partnerships with. And I'll go over them quickly. Um, you see a flag of Israel down at the bottom. Well, I blogged one time of how we were Skyping with Holocaust survivors. An organization in North Jersey read my blog. They called me. I got them in contact with my teacher. They flew my teacher out to Israel for a week, all expenses paid, to form a partnership with a high school in Naharia. Two weeks later, all those administrators from Israel came to New Milford High School for a summit. So we got to connect with them. Oh, guess what? My friends from CBS came. They did a uh, nice little piece on it. On the bottom right is ClassLink. We use ClassLink as part of our uh, bring your own device solution. So if you don't know about ClassLink, it's amazing. What I don't have on here is uh, Crescerance. Uh, Crescerance is a, a mobile app company who has worked with our uh, digital journalism students to create an app for the Lance, which is our digital newspaper. And if you haven't seen the Lance, uh, I'm going to put it right here. It, it, it is an amazing site, the Lance.net. You've got to check it out, what our students are doing uh, digitally. Abermedia, Abermedia gave us $10,000 worth of document cameras, student response pens. They came to New Jersey from Arizona twice to do professional development, all because of the contact on Twitter. I connected with my peeps at Google, took my kids to Google in New York City, their offices. My students tried out the Chromebook virtually before any other students. They gave feedback on it, but they also got to get the Google experience. Uh, the Newark Museum, my students were able to a Twitter connection, go down to the Newark Museum and work with the uh, Newark Museum on bringing their collection up to date. They actually showed the curators, how to use Web 2.0 tools to make the collection more relevant and meaningful. And uh, shameless plug, um, one of my great uh, friends, uh, TEQ, they're stationed out here in the Northeast. We host a conference called the Edscape Conference. You want to talk about an opportunity? You know what? I've been hosting a conference now going on my fourth year. It is free for every single one of my teachers in my district. What do they get? An internationally renowned keynote, this year it's George Curls, last year it was Vicki Davis, a keynote, 60 concurrent sessions, breakfast, lunch, giveaways, an innovation lab, and guess what? It's only $35 for anyone else that wants to come. And we welcome anybody from 
any country. So even if you're not in the United States, you're still welcome to come to uh, Edscape. Amazing conference. So those are just some of the opportunities when you tell your story and you connect. Now just some best practices. When you are using social media, keep it professional. Always remember your role within the community. Think before you post the internet. That's the whole common sense practice principle. Understand that you need to create a positive visual footprint for you and your school. And when using social media in the classroom, have defined learning goals. Now for my grand finale, because I'm ready to lose my voice. You know, ultimately my message here is this. We need to collaborate and share. Together we're better. The more people that I can get sharing and telling their story is going to make me a better principal, a better learner, and a better leader. Take risks. Learn and model. Listen, if you're a leader and you want all this stuff to happen, guess what? If you're not doing it, you're not being a good role model, it's not going to happen. I've been there, done that, learned from that mistake. You also got to take risks. You know, if you want to do these great things, you want to be innovative, guess what? You're going to have to take calculated risks. And you have to understand that you need to create a culture that does not fear failure. Failure will happen. No longer is the F word a bad word in education. We learn from failure. But if you fear failure, innovation is not going to follow. So please remember that. We're going to fail. It's learning from those mistakes to move forward. We live in a globally connected society. Just makes sense that we tap into that vast resource. We all have brains, so guess what? If you don't blog, start. I don't care if you think you're not a writer. I was there. I used every excuse in the world. You know what I've gotten better at since I got on social media and become a transparent? I've stopped making excuses. I always had every excuse to not do something. And I think that is a problem in education in general. We have too many excuses not to do something. So guess what? Blog. Share what you're doing. It could be a paragraph, a video. It could be short, sweet. Support. Support comes in the form of professional development, being flexible so you can Skype with other time zones, pulling kids out of class for authentic experiences to video conference, um, resources, financial infrastructure. That is what I mean by support. I mentioned flexibility. Don't let time be an excuse. Listen, I'm not trying to be arrogant here, but if I can find time to do all of this, so can you. So can anyone. When it's embedded into professional practice, it's time well spent. And here I'm taking a quote from uh, one of my favorite movies from my younger years. It's all about passion. Take your passion and make it happen. When you do, great things will happen. And that is, I'll put my video back on for a minute. Uh, that is my, uh, my session on uh, Leadership 2.0. Um, I spoke a lot. I'm sorry. Hopefully I gave you some, some good ideas. Listen, uh, I'm here for you. So if you have any questions for me, if you want my, BO, my BYOD policy, acceptable use, if you want to learn more about how we use an open courseware, listen, I'm here to serve because I know the more I give, the more I'm going to get back in return. I am not an expert at any of this. I am just a passionate leader that wants to do what I do better. I wanted, I wanted to become more effective and efficient, and social media has provided me that tool to do that. So uh, I think I'm right on time with this, and I am going to sign off for the night. And uh, on that note, thank you again for joining me, and I'll see you uh, in the Twitter sphere or in some other social media space. Good night, everybody.